more information, go to elections.pacifica.org. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1 p.m. Stay tuned next for your own health and fitness. Welcome to your own health and fitness. I'm health integrationist Lena Berman with Jeffrey Fawcett, and we come to you weekly with a critical, independent voice on the politics and practice of health and the environment. An unfortunate characteristic of the human animal is the ability to throw ourselves into a full-on stress response with a thought. Stanford neurobiologist Dr. Robert Sapolsky opens his book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, by describing how you can wake up at 2 a.m. worrying about an important presentation you need to be rested to do. While worrying about not sleeping, you notice a vague headache and start imagining that you have a brain tumor. Animals don't do this. This capacity to reach a state of total fear with a thought makes us vulnerable to manipulation by outside forces that would control us and carried by all forms of media, social, news, and even the beliefs of your family and friends. Today we look at fear, how we can learn from it, how we're manipulated by it, what makes its effect worse, better, in fact, what it's for. We're going to start with some thoughts by Jeff Fawcett. What frightens you? Climate change, losing your sight, genetically modified organisms chemicals and products that might harm you, that might harm your children. Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, terrorists, the National Security Agency, your mother. A loud, unexpected noise, mentally ill people getting their hands on guns. There's plenty to choose from, as I'm sure you're all too aware. And as I'm sure you're also all too aware, we swim in a sea of information that heightens our fears. The social psychologist Peter Gray writes extensively about how healthy it is for children to play freely. A few years ago, Dr. Gray wrote an article titled, The Decline of Play and the Rise of Psychopathology in Children and Adolescents, which I think accurately captures the content of the piece. In it, he argues that over the latter half of the 20th century, children's free play declined in large part because parents, educators, public health officials, and others increasingly feared for children's health and safety. The effect of those fears was the increasing imposition of adult-directed activities on children's time. And the effect of that shift from child-directed to adult-directed activity corresponds to a rise in child and adolescent psychopathology, in particular the rise of anxiety and depression and the decline in a sense of personal power. Are those fears justified? In a recent report, the Department of Health and Human Services suggests that over the last 80 years, children's safety has steadily improved. This might have happened precisely because parents and others have been more vigilant because they've been increasingly fearful. Yet the improvement has been consistent since the mid-1930s during the first half of the 20th century in what has been called the golden era of childhood play when, presumably, dangers were rampant. Before we get caught up in the issues this raises, let me say that fear is a good thing. It will keep you out of trouble. In his book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, neuroscientist Robert Sapolsky describes how a zebra who sees a tawny patch in the high grass is better served by instant fright and the urge to flee than pausing to ponder whether that might only be a patch of dry grass and not a lion. In fact, that's one place where fears come from, natural selection. Zebras who startle are more likely to escape predators than zebras who ponder. 
Those more inclined to startle and escape are more likely to survive and breed and make more zebras that startle and escape. Neuroscientists such as Joseph Ledoux talk about stimuli and responses that are species typical. Ledoux reluctantly refers to these as innate, what frightens a zebra or a human without thought. For example, humans and other primates are prone to be frightened by snakes, zebras not so much. The point here is that the things that frighten us and every other kind of creature and the way we and they respond has a long evolutionary history. That, of course, is true for the full range of our emotions, not just fear. The way we and other creatures respond when frightened is captured by the well-known triad fight, flee, or freeze. And that's what fear mobilizes in you. All the physiological mechanisms you'll need to do one of those things in order to avoid being eaten or damaged or incapacitated before you can breed. I don't want to make it sound as though our innate fears are all instinctive. We learn to avoid dangerous or unpleasant people, places, and things. Once learned, we don't have to ponder how to respond. We just do. That's what makes them innate. The classic experiments in conditioning are all about how exper- experimental animals, such as rats, are taught to do or not do certain things based on how scientists manipulate the animal's environment, the electric shock and the food pellet being particular favorites. The good news is that innate fears can, to some extent, be unlearned in a physiological process called extinction. A rablat uh, A lab rat that is taught to associate pain with a particular environment will get stressed out when forced into that environment. But if he or she ceases to experience pain, the anxiety will dissipate or even disappear altogether. Humans engage in psychotherapy, self-help books, and counter-learning experiences of all sorts to have the same effect. Fear can also be a bad thing, of course, because it can get you into trouble. Lions typically hunt in pairs. One frightens a zebra who runs into the paws of a waiting mate. So the fear-induced impulse to flee ought to be tempered by some pondering as to which route his or her flight should take. So if Donald Trump scares you to death, you might want to consider whether fleeing to Hillary Clinton is the best response. Not a recommendation, just a thought. Which brings us to fears we acquire through learning from other humans. A research article titled Social Learning of Fear describes how fear can be conditioned not only from direct experience, but through paying attention to what's happening to others. We can acquire fears by seeing others traumatized, but also by observing the body language of others who are frightened. In movies, there's the advantage of a soundtrack that plays ominous music as frightening images and frightened actors appear on the screen to let you know that something frightening is about to happen or is already happening. Having a soundtrack for living would be handy, but it isn't likely to show up anytime soon. The significance of the research on the social learning of fear is that directly learned and socially learned fears share many neural circuits, but socially learned fears enlist circuits for recognition of faces, body language, and other social communication. In other words, it enlists those complex features of our nervous system that make us highly pro-social creatures able to read minds with considerable skill based on facial expression, body language, vocalizations, and so on. And here, too, fear can be a good thing or not. It depends on how you respond. And that has to do with how you experience what you're feeling as part of what you're doing. After all, the biological and evolutionary purpose of fear is to get you to do something. Anthony Damasio describes how our emotions arise from how our nervous system scans our body to make sense of what's physiologically going on, what's coming in through our senses, and what our body wants to do about it. Fear is the message, predator alert, do something now. Fear of missing out 
is a psychological phenomenon that's received increasing interest as social media has become more prevalent. Fear of missing out is in the realm of computer addiction. The fear here is the fear of regret that motivates people to remain continually informed of what other people are doing, or at least what they're posting. I don't think this is a particularly new fear, just one that's significantly enhanced by smartphones and tablets and other technologies designed to keep people permanently gossiping. I might, you, know, you might question whether this really qualifies as fear, but social media has led to other phenomena that clearly do. At last year's annual conference of the British Psychology Society, researcher Pam Ramsden reported the effects of horrific unedited images available through social media on the emotional state of viewers. A quarter of the nearly 200 participants in the study showed significant signs of post-traumatic stress disorder despite not having any history of trauma. The significant background to the study is that it has been known for some time that many people's occupation subjects them to traumatic events that also elicit symptoms of PTSD, particularly among healthcare workers. I'd also note, to return to Dr. Gray and the fear for children, that our increasing exposure to traumatic images in the media generally, social, mass, alternative, is likely to have a similar effect. For some time, researchers have reported that the use of frightening news is not only a news publishing mainstay, if it bleeds, it reads, it's also increasing. This has elicited a wide-ranging wide range, discourse about the culture of fear. The core argument in this, culture, in this literature is that if it bleeds, it leads is not just old newspaper wisdom, nor a sad commentary on human nature, whatever that's supposed to be. Instead, it is one of the many methods carefully invoked to traumatize people in order to better control them through a wide variety of methods for disseminating information. The biology of how this works makes perfect sense. Your nervous system works to get you out of trouble when you're afraid. It's one of the ways in which it's good for you, at least when you're actually in danger. For example, when afraid, your attention is focused on the source of the threat. That zebra is, pay that zebra is paying close attention to that lion, if it is a lion. Of course, the zebra may, might not pay much attention to the whereabouts of the lion's hunting partner. So maybe the smart zebra studies the hunting behavior of lions by watching how other zebras get hunted by lions. If they had opposable thumbs, they could invent technologies that record lion kills, and then other technologies to broadcast those recordings to other zebras as part of a routine communications methodology that might be called, oh, the news cycle. But Zebras don't have opposable thumbs, and so don't have those technologies, and so also don't have a news cycle feeding an unquenchable thirst for information, and so are not cursed with the fear of missing out. Instead, and this is why zebras don't get ulcers, they outrun the lion, but not always. And then their body rolls back on all the charged up physiology that's referred to in the neuroscience literature as the fear response. Some of this consists of physiologically releasing the effects of fear, for example, by shivering. And fairly soon, the zebra is back to normal life, a normal life of grazing. It's called recovery. What happens if you live in an environment that saturates you with information about traumatic events. Lions at every turn. An environment and its associated information cycle that doesn't let you recover. Humans and other creatures not only pay attention differently when frightened, they think differently. An experiment plotted what's called a response curve for trading off one thing for another. That is, what you want and what you're willing to give for it.
The experiment first experiment established trade-offs under normal conditions. When fear was introduced into the experiment, subjects acted irrationally according to the normal trade-offs. Irrationally meant that their choices weren't consistent with how they previously made choices under so-called normal conditions. But the choices were internally consistent for being in a state of fear. In other words, the subjects, when frightened, might seem irrational as compared to their normal behavior, but quite rationally for being in a state of fear. The Ramsden study I mentioned earlier that found a quarter of people who viewed traumatic images showed signs of post-traumatic stress disorder also found heightened stress and anxiety in the other participants. The point of which is that in experiencing or observing frightening events, your response is not either or, either blind fear or utter indifference. It's on a continuum between indifference and to panic. Where you land on that continuum will depend on the exact nature of the danger, how capable you think and feel you are to deal with it, and how sensitive you are to threats generally and of that particular kind of threat, all of which come from your personal and family history. For example, in a study of children's reactions to the 2013 Boston Marathon explosions, the more exposure to media coverage children experienced, the more they developed post-traumatic stress symptoms. But children with greater sympathetic nervous system reactivity were even more likely to develop post-traumatic stress symptoms. This should be no surprise since the sympathetic nervous system is responsible for the stress response and the, th and the fear response. And it also should be no surprise to find out that some people are more easily frightened than others. Some people experience greater trauma than others in the womb, as they grow up, as they mature. Some people are innately more sensitive, not because of bad luck or bad genes, but because trauma in earlier generations gets passed along to later generations. For example, rat mothers who are not nurtured, nurtured as pups are not good nurturers to their own pups. But are we collectively more easily frightened now than we used to be? That's what Peter Gray suggests when asking why children's free play has declined and, as a consequence, why child and adolescent psychopathology has increased. Remember that these are children who are more anxious and have a lower sense of personal power than earlier generations and that these children will likely grow into adulthood more anxious and with a diminished sense of personal power. Dr. Gray is right, of course. The bad news didn't just fall from the sky. The culture of fear is quite intentional, and the intention is to manipulate us to accept a way of life that is not in our interest. The culture of fear is promoted through the dissemination of information, no matter whether the source is corporate or alternative. The extreme is the mobilization of fear in what has been called moral panics by design, where the very life of the culture, the nation, the, our way of life is made to seem in danger of made to seem in danger by what our leaders tell us terrorism being a prime example the lifeblood of the moral panic is information which begs the question is it possible to be well informed without being traumatized well i think we we believe that that is true and if we have time at the end i guess we'll talk about some of the stuff we've been hearing on the radio like uh, generative what is it called? Generative? Generative journalism. Journalism. You're listening to Your Own Health and Fitness. <clears throat> I'm Lena Berman. Jeff Fawcett has just uh, finished sharing some thoughts of his. I'm going to give it a go, as they say, on this topic of fear, which is what we're talking about today. And some of this is going to overlap with uh, what Jeffrey was discussing because he did the hard work of looking up a lot of research and came back into the house with a pile about the size of a small phone book. And I looked through it and sort of picked the things that struck me. So there's a little overlap, but I'll be covering it from a slightly different angle. 
Um, again, the topic is fear, and the show is your own health and fitness. So, you know, this business of us having two different types of nervous systems, the sympathetic, which is the one that makes you more apt to respond strongly to messages of fear or, or hyperarousal in general. Very important part. You can't live without that. We also have a parasympathetic which is what helps you to go to sleep. And then we have basically the difference between the two types of people are there are the people who fall asleep on airplanes and those that sit holding, white-knuckling their uh, the, the seat arms or sympathetic dominance. And good luck if you're a sympathetic dominant because it's much harder to... Um, you can, It's very hard to overcome having sympathetic dominance. And I think that the key is not to try to escape your nature, but to counter it with other experiences <clears throat> so that the things that made you more sensitive and more sympathetic dominant are uh, cared for so that you care for those things in your adult life. Um, clearly, people who, as Jeffrey mentioned, have come from lines of people who um, suffered lots of trauma uh, and there's so many different groups now, and it continues. Those people will, even even third generation, even grandchildren, will still have sympathetic dominance, and it's 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 an epigenetic effect. I mean, it isn't just exposure to toxins, which although that's a stressor too, that causes people to flip into a hypersensitivity situation, but it's also um, there are things that are passed on beyond things that can specifically alter DNA expression. There are things like stress, which also alter DNA expression. So sympathetic dominant people, you know, it's it, not that you want to identify yourself as being hypersensitive, but you're likely to be all of your life, and the, the job at hand is to find a way to rebalance your system a little now. That said, parasympathetic dominant people are not free of an effect. And the reason we're discussing this topic today is that it's clear that <clears throat> fear messages are coming at us more and more and more. In this study that, that Jeffrey mentioned that was, um, was covered, uh, it was a study that was published in the British Psychological Society last year. <clears throat> Even those with no history at all of trauma scored high on clinical measures of P PTSD when exposed to media, media coverage of violent events. So everyone gets this. They analyzed a decade's worth of news coverage and they concluded... Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm mixing Kasha Midborscht here. Um, so nearly a quarter of participants who had never had a history of trauma scored high on clinical measures of PC, PTSD. So the message here is that study has shown us that, these are young people, that all people, regardless of what they come into the world with, are, are vulnerable to this kind of concentration on fearful events. And... Another uh, study that was done in, uh, that was studied uh, study that was done in, in reported on in 1999 in the Sociological Quarterly was discussing an analysis of news coverage over a decade, and it won't surprise you that this period, that's well in advance of tw of 9/11, showed that during this decade there was an uptick in the coverage and concentration on fear. The authors conclude that this legitimized increasing surveillance, military spending, and building more prisons. So for 10 years, more than 10 years, 12 years or so before 9-11 happened, we were being primed to uh, feel comfortable with the idea that we needed more surveillance, etc., etc., more control. Now, the authors point something out that I found important. It's an important distinction. They distinguish between fear and danger. Fear is something, uh, fear is, it, it leads to a kind of powerless state. You know, you just, you're kind of paralyzed by fear or you're running away. But danger is something that you can, you, it leads to action. In, in face of danger, people act. 
and they're not powerless. So there is this distinction between whether you are mobilizing people to do things, to, to make plans and whatnot, to, to protect themselves versus making people feel powerless with fear. So what what this con- what this paper concluded with is that there is a clear and intentional manipulation of the population using fear and terrorism, and it's worldwide. You know, they 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 were studying this corner of the universe, but it's clear on other papers that Jeffrey brought uh, home that uh, terrorism is is planned and thought of as a way to control populations, demonstrations of terrorism, and I know that my listenership, our listenership, certainly knows where to go with that in, in your mind. Another study that uh, was was from the University of Buffalo. It was reprinted in Silence, Science Daily in, in uh, 2013. The study is called, What, Me Worry? The authors examined information about seeking behavior versus information avoidance, and this was around climate change as a topic. Those who felt hopeful about climate change avoided exposure to additional information, said that it represented little risk to humans and animals, and that they felt their knowledge was to be sufficient. Lucky them. The paper's recommendations uh, were to stress curiosity when you're discussing these things, and um, to, to work to debunk false beliefs, and to counter complacency by stressing a positive attitude about learning, I have to say this reminds me of a joke, and I, I, will exp- I will say this joke with apologies to any listeners that may be offended, but it's about Christian scientists in hell. And they're standing around with flames burning everywhere saying, I'm not here, and it's not hot. Well, this leads me to a question about whether or not we should trust our feelings. Um, there's there's ample reason to think that strong feelings shouldn't be trusted, but I really believe that they are messengers and need to be witnessed and heeded, not necessarily acted out on in the moment. Remember that perceiving danger allows us to avoid it. So, again, the distinction between being paralyzed by fear versus uh, perceiving danger and doing what needs to be done. And, again, the reason we're concerned here is because... We may be getting manipulated uh, by fear in the media and in the culture right now. Um, and I'm not saying that there aren't things to be afraid of. <laughs> I, I clearly think there are plenty of things that we need to regard as danger that we need to respond to. Certainly climate change is one of them. That's my opinion. So I might remind people that the way the stress response works, I'm sure most of you have heard this enough to to know, but just to remind you that you get a stress response uh, and it can happen instead of almost stepping on a snake and backing up. It can also happen when you're stuck in traffic and you're getting stressed out about needing to get somewhere and you get you get a full-on stress response. And the problem there is that you aren't able to move in that situation. You're stewing in it at that point. And this is a kind of sociological chronic stress that we, I think, all are experiencing more and more in this society that we're in, where people are working too hard and and are are caught, are trapped physically, uh, because the stress response is mobilized and then it's made for you to move or respond and then to recover. And it's very difficult in our current style of society where people are getting stressed out and getting angry and not able to move or to move through it. Um, There's a wonderful film that came out recently that I have great affection for. If you've not seen it, I I do recommend it. It's called, it's a Pixar film. It's called Inside Out. And it uses images that children can relate to as they explain the interactions between our feelings, something adults rarely understand either. Now, clearly, without fear, as I said, you can't, can't protect yourself. But Inside Out shows us that our feelings work in concert with each other. Now, we all know, as adults, that fear is often covered up with anger, another form of protection. But what touched me most was their depiction of the relationship of sadness to joy. It seems that unless we can really feel loss, grief, sadness, we forget to appreciate what matters to us 
sadness can bind us back to our sense of joy and wonder about the world and the things we love. So without being able to feel sad, sadness often brings us back to our love, our feelings of love, and that, and, and, and that of course, leads to feeling joy. These, these are very important things to remember about uh, how our feelings interact with each other and why each one of them has a place and, and a sort of ecology, that our feelings have an ecology. So rather than just disassociating ourselves from our feelings, finding a way to not pay close attention to them, I'm recommending, as I often do, that we do. Now we're going to take just a brief musical break here. And we'll come back to the show that we're doing today about fear. This is your own health and fitness. Some people think that's all we cover. I don't think so. But anyway, uh, Jeff Fawcett and I will be right back after this musical break. We'll come back. This is your own health and fitness. Stay with us. This is Your Own Health and Fitness. Visit our website, yourownhealthandfitness.org, for easier extended access to our over 600 archive shows with our library card feature. There's a free stream of this week's show, and there's lots more at yourownhealthandfitness.org. And if you wish to reach us, please do that by email. It's admin, A-D-M-I-N, at yourownhealthandfitness.org. Back to our show about fear, which we believe is... Uh, becoming a cultural norm right now. <laughs> now, there's another thing that Jeffrey mentioned, which was um, this this the work of of Antonio Damasio, and he, in in his book Descartes' Era, he 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 talks about the fact that we aren't separate mind and body. We are both working together, interacting together, and this is what makes us different from artificial intelligence or robots. We have physical experiences and our physical experiences are intrinsic to our emotional experiences and of course he talks about the fact that as Jeff said the body is scanned constantly by our consciousness to perceive whether or not everything is alright and if we don't feel alright we're likely to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning so um, it's important to know that it isn't just manipulation of the culture that's frightening you that sometimes you although you have a you know your amygdala as you know this part of your brain is the repository for for uh not so for good memories bad memories scary memories to protect you so in the future you had this bad experience so let's not do that again i remember this tend to remember it better than the um the good happy experiences oh i had a surprise birthday party i really enjoyed no we remember the bad and those memories inform us when we're woken up in the middle of the night during the time of the night where we're vulnerable which is like between two and four that's a vulnerable time for humans it's also kind of a second sleep cycle for humans in the daytime so at night if you're going to wake up scared that's when you're going to do it but it may be that you're fighting a cold or it may be that you ate something for dinner that didn't set, set right and now your gut is a little unpleasant you know so but we go into we go into a cogitating state and we start spinning out because that's what humans have the talent for (laughs) but it means that there's a relationship between thoughts and physical symptoms and that the more embodied people are the easier time they're going to have staying present and bringing the physical back into you know when you're in a tense in a tense moment 
that if you can get back on your feet, literally, you're going to have a better experience with things. So basically the message of this, what I'm trying to say here is remember that if you wake up at two or three in the morning and you're panicky, you you may not have a brain tumor, you may not have cancer, you may just have your body may just be uncomfortable for some reason, or you're you're you've been digesting a lot of fear things around you in the culture. You saw a scary movie, you watched another one of these dy- dystopian science fiction films, which are really about the present, I believe, as Jeffrey has said, but you know it's there and it's in you to be frightened, so you're you're going there. And there are practices you can do with yourself at that moment if you can manage it, which, I mean, the simplest thing is to breathe, is to just start breathing and noticing whether or not you're safe in the moment and how your bed feels and how your feet feel against the sheets. And um, if you feel like you're able to, if you don't, you don't want to like push yourself further into a stress response, but if you're able to sometimes doing some imagery where you can have a dialogue with the symptom that's coming up for you so you can have a conversation. What do you need from me? You can find an image. You just allow yourself to see an image for this, uh, this feeling that you're having, this physical sensation. And ha- what do you want from me? What do you need from me? What is it? What, and whether or not you can, you can say, well, I don't know if I can do that right now. Well, what if I do this? And then you, you converse with it. And it's often very surprising because sometimes the scariest things are really not scary when you start to have a conversation with them. So it's it's a call to having an inner dialogue with yourself, having the capacity to learn from the feelings. Because the feelings are trying to, just like nightmares, they're trying to get your attention. Uh, and if you think of them as your friends, that they are there to try to have a dialogue with you and and get your attention and sometimes they have to get rough with you in order to do that then it's less frightening so that's you know and then there's you know the usual things that i recommend there's all kinds of i really believe strongly in the flower essences uh because they're so gentle and they're they're really quite i just keep falling back on them in moments of of stress that and they're going to be different for different people you're going to need different things there are things that really open up your heart there are things that calm you down there are things that uh, for people who tend to disassociate, there are people that there there are flower essences that help you pull out of it. There are flower essences for being able to deal with a polluted environment or a lot of electromagnetic waves. Um, the the book I like the best, as I've recommended before, is Healing Bouquet by Vinton McKay. But there are also all kinds of resources uh, from Flower Essence Society, which is another company that makes all sorts of things, including a wonderful remedy called Yarrow Environmental Solution, Yarrow in general for sensitive people. And then, as I said, there's uh, just a myriad of things that help you pull, you know, get through anger or, anger or impatience or just really astonishing. And I find making making a combination bottle of those things and using it when you wake up. And then there's just Rescue Remedy, Bach Rescue Remedy and Bach Rescue Sleep. There's things like rubbing uh, some lavender on the bottoms of your feet, some good organic lavender. So the point is to just help your body calm down at that point so that you can, you know, and then maybe maybe you read, uh, car, you know, comics, not scary comics. Maybe you read Calvin and Hobbes at that hour of the night. I don't know what works for you. Fairy tales, things that are not frightening anyway. So I, it won't be surprising that I will tell you that regular physical practices help you rebuild this relationship, obviously, right? Meditation, yoga, qigong, exercise, just getting outside in a tense moment. And that can include at night if you're in a neighborhood where you can do that or if you live in the country. But just changing your environment and possibly if you're really getting plagued by uh distressing and frightening thoughts maybe even exploring the possibility of moving somewhere else can help you to counter the helplessness and feeling trapped that can happen for people sometimes Um, or what other kind of work can i do for a living if this isn't working since feelings do as as we learn in inside out so so well using wonderful little characters and cartoons since feelings go from one to another in a wheel For instance, fear goes to anger. And we've all experienced that. You start to get afraid and then you get angry at someone. Um, Stopping the wheel and exploring the feeling you're having may help you to examine what, if anything, the feeling's trying to alert you to and whether or not you're dealing with old fears that are stopping you from moving on, etc. So our stress response 
is absolutely, you know, the body does things for a reason. The stress response is absolutely critical for learning, learning and adaptation. That's what it's really for. So, as I said, that's why we tend to retain more bad memories than good. And the mobilizing effect of fear may help us to make critical decisions going forward. So it's not very helpful when it paralyzes us. And again, I'll remind you of the whole issue of danger versus fear. So it brings up, it's a call to action. What do we need to do to change or to protect ourselves? I mean, obviously, if if you're in a critical situation where you need to mobilize yourself very quickly and make fast decisions, which is what fear is for, then you, you're not going to, as, as Jeffrey said about the, the um, zebra, you're not going to stop and cogitate about whether you're, you know, or have a conversation with another zebra about whether that actually is grass or a lion. You're going to move, and the same is true in any dangerous situation that you're in. It's interesting that um, it reminds me of a, of a Zen story about being in a rowboat in a fog, on a foggy lake and... Um, if, if if the rowboat, I believe this was a story that was told by Joko Beck, but in the if if you're in the rowboat and you're very peaceful and it's foggy, another rowboat comes and drifts over to you and bangs into your rowboat. If it's an empty rowboat, you're going to just push it out of the way. So that's like fear versus danger. You do, it isn't even danger. You just deal with it. You're just dealing with it. However, if the rowboat is full of other people, you're likely to get into an angry state or an argument or something else. And what she says is the lesson here is that all rowboats are empty rowboats. So what's important during intense emotional moments is if you're feeling really intense emotions, that's not the best time to make big life decisions or even to maybe act out in the moment. Again, unless you need to run. So the reason for this is because critical thinking is trumped, and the pun here is intended, by high emotion. So if you're feeling a lot of very, very strong emotion, and you have the luxury of being able to wait, it's always good to wait before you act. Uh, it, it, as, as I mentioned before, the stress response is a learning and adaptation response because you, you have stress hormones go up when you're uh, teaching yourself new material or learning to play music or do or anything. It, but, but, but the learning, the stress response, the, the release of the catecholamines and the stress hormones is particularly designed to have you learn and then rest. So recovery is critical. There's, I think, you may remember years and years and years ago, I, I interviewed someone, those of you who listen all the time, that um, that had a practice based on getting people to go back into stressful situations in a physical way and experience the physical experiences of shaking or shivering uh, in order to get over some traumas. Now, I'm not a big fan of therapies that re-traumatize traumatized people but the point here is the is the beneficial effects of of the f- feeling the physical symptoms as they're happening so if you um somebody hits your back bumper in traffic you'll notice that if you sit there for just a moment before you get out of the car you're shaking or if you get out of the car you're shaking and the point here is not to say oh it's fine i'm fine but to allow yourself to shiver and shake so to give give the body that moment to experience what's going on and then start to recover um but if you're if you're not recovering if you are someone who is shall we say being coerced by a work situation or a family situation to never recover, to never rest, it's, it's likely that you are more likely to wake up anxious in the middle of the night because you're overtired. So you'll get, a, you'll get an, over, overly, an overly strong stress response from exhaustion. So you push through the initial stress response, you don't recover, then you really get hit. And if we believe that people are easier to control when they're paralyzed by fear, you can guess that along with 
fearful images in the media. A society that's designed to keep people overoccupied and overwhelmed will also contribute to a population that's easier to control. So, for instance, let's say that your work demands that you're in touch at any moment. And I remember years ago having an employer say that I should read the materials to take care of my client, uh, even while I'm doing my morning ablutions, that I should be constantly thinking about this stuff. Well, that's nonsense. And now with cell phones, you're expected to be required to answer your phone at all times and to never have a moment off. And I suggest, and I've suggested this before, that you recall the fact that people don't answer their cell phones all the time because sometimes they're working or doing something else, they can't answer the phone. So they're going to check messages and call later. And you have an opportunity in that situation, even if your work demands that you carry a cell phone, that you need to set your own limits around that to to decide how and when you're going to respond to the return calls. If nothing else, because you're less likely to act out in anger or to be explosive if you're if you have some buffer zones, if you have some margins around what's happening. So I believe in the future that it will be illegal to require this of employees, this business of of, um, uh, expecting them to be in touch at all times. You're listening to your own health and fitness. I'm Lena Berman with Jeff Fawcett. Jeff Fawcett started us out with his own comments around fear. That's the topic of today's show. And um, I'm now sharing my two cents. Uh, so I will go back to the idea that different people are going to respond differently to fearful and hyper uh, situations that cause hyper arousal. And there's environmental reasons for that. There are things in the environment that cause hyper arousal. Certainly the digital revolution is one of them. The more fields around you, the more hyper aroused you will feel. You'll feel it in your chest. You'll feel it everywhere. You feel a little wired. So there are things that will be difficult for people to manage if they are more sympathetic dominant. And and for sympathetic dominance, who I always feel protective of, I recommend that you find strategies for making room for your sensitivities and taking your sensitivities seriously. You don't have to get other people to take it seriously. In fact, I recommend that you don't discuss it too much with other people. You just tell people what you need from them. Please don't come over... Uh, with your clothes saturated with uh, perfume or, or stuff like that, if that's something that bothers you. Or uh, if if you cannot bring your, your iPad along with you, otherwise I'll wrap it in aluminum foil. There's strategy. But take your, take your needs seriously. For parasympathetic dominant people, the trick here is not to disassociate. Because if you disassociate, you really are going to miss your life while it's happening. And you may miss very important messages that are coming from your feelings if you're not feeling them so i I remember hearing somebody say in an interview somewhere like um he had an experience where his cell phone was down and he started to panic and he realized that what he was panicking about was that he might actually have to feel his feelings for three minutes so i think people are beginning to see this what's happening so so i i am really calling people to look at the sort of beautiful relationship between the feelings so that you have a functional ecology inside you, the body and the mind and the feelings working with each other and the fact that they teach you and help you to learn so that you can make really healthy decisions about what to do and how to respond to the dangers that may be coming. So in closing, as I said, use your fear, use your feelings to guide you to engage instead of checking out. And there are strategies for finding out what's going on that are supportive to action rather than inaction. And I think Jeff and I are going to talk about maybe some alternative types of media, for instance. Be very aware of your choices because you do have them, but be aware of your choices and information sources. If listening to the news is really making you nuts, and I think it makes me nuts, I will listen to the headlines, and then when I hear that they're going to discuss the same, one of the five crises there, or, or disasters or terrorist attacks, I just turn it off and put on some music. You get to make those choices. You can be informed without being traumatized and paralyzed. 
even with things that you may not be able to control, you can still become informed on the things you can do to protect yourself and your community. And I'm observing that many people are engaging with their neighbors now for disaster preparedness and even like support for people who want to age in their homes instead of ending up in some kind of, you know, care place and and share tasks for, for each other, for example. And remember... No matter how scared you get about, oh, well, California is experiencing a drought and now we're all going to, it's going to turn into a desert and we're going to have no water and people are going to be running around with guns. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. Just remember that you don't know. And sometimes the things you're most afraid of are not the things that happen. Something else bad may happen, but it won't be that thing necessarily. And there's no reason based on historical fact to think that during terrible human crises, people actually seek to help each other. People actually come to the, they feel that helps their stress responses to help. So remember that historically people help each other and there's no reason to assume that that won't continue to happen. Unexamined fear, in my experience, drives people to do really terrible things and to hate people and to don't be one of those people. Don't be a person that's driven by fear to do terrible things. Don't be one of them. So those are those are my comments. And I believe that Jeff and I now are going to talk a little bit about maybe some healthier sources of media. Did you want to start off since I've been talking for a long time? Yes. Uh, it was we, we were listening to uh, Project Censored uh, radio show uh, a few days ago, and um, it had this segment on uh, regarding um, something called generative journalism. Um, they were interviewing... The, the way Project Cent, for those of you who are not familiar with Project Censored, the, uh, they, um, they have, uh, students in journalism or actually in a wide variety of disciplines who participate trying to reveal stories, follow stories that don't make, make it into the mainstream media. That's the overall, uh, goal. And, uh, Project Censored is a form of journalism which has arisen in the last several decades which counters mainstream media and the myth of media objectivity. Yeah, and uh, another another uh, program is or, or group is fair fairness and accuracy in reporting that does very much the same thing that talks about how news that we hear is is biased it is inherently biased uh is inherently biased because we all have a viewpoint and we all have to make choices about what alleged facts uh have occurred so this um this one student who was discussing this new uh new concept in journalism which she called generative journalism. Um, what it seeks to do is to actively promote, uh, put simplistically, the good things that are going on in communities, to be actively involved, to not only have a point of view, but to be part of the solution. And that that view is largely the, the main website for for folks who are performing this is called axiom.com a-x-i-o-n um, dot com that has a wide variety of stories that are about communities doing such things and how reporting and the reporting of that news is integral to what they're doing. And this connects to something we've discussed on this show before, which is the con on several shows is the concept of the narrative that you see yourself in the narrative of which you are a part the stories. We tell ourselves the stories we tell ourselves. Yes. And, um, so this form of journalism sees itself, these practitioners see themselves as intimately involved in shaping a particular kind of narrative, self-consciously, as opposed to mainstream journalism, which uh, it is obvious to everyone that they, ha they are shaping a narrative, but they see themselves as not. So 
uh, and simply follow the they simply follow the news cycle, whereas these folks are actively uh, involved in changing the world. In fact, that's what they say. What generative uh, generative journalism is about. You might mention the name of the professor at UCSF, uh, University of San Francisco, Univers- or other SFSU, San Francisco Ken, State Ken University. Burrows. Ken, Ken Burroughs, B-U-R-R-O-W-S, Ken. Yeah, Ken with two N's. Yeah, oh, with two N's. With two N's. So people uh, can look for him as well. Um, it's on The information on this is on the uh, Project Censored website, and Project Censored itself is actually based at Sonoma State. San Francisco State is all students are also involved in this, and uh, it's uh, both a good program and uh, a good source of news. Another source of news that I will mention, uh, I'm sure that there are others, um, is Yes Magazine. Yeah, I, I like Yes Magazine because it covers people doing good things. The only thing I find about about it is that, that they're not in-depth articles, and I find that the Project Censored work and this, this generative yes. media is more in-depth. It brings up another thing about all of this uh, is that <laughs> this, this, this is something that comes out of, of having inner dialogues with yourself, I think, and also maybe even uh, doing some counseling if you have somebody you trust to, to work with who, who is sensitive to your feelings, um, is that I recall that my mother used to, when, whenever my mother heard me say something that frightened her because she didn't like what I was going to do, And it frightened her. She would come at me with all this anger and she'd start blowing it all up and saying really scary stuff. And I learned finally to say to her, just like I had to start saying to the thoughts in my head, well, wait a minute, that's not useful. That isn't helping me. That's not very good. Do you have a concrete suggestion for me? Do you have some suggestions? Do you have some ideas instead of just blasting me? And I've been using that with people who come at me with... um, information that they feel very assured about about how the world's coming to an end and uh, you know it isn't that i don't believe it's coming to an end i feel a a sort of appropriate sense of grief and sadness and appreciation for everything because i think it might things as we know it it might be coming to an end but even even if it's not you know whether it is or not i don't know for sure so when people start expounding you know sort of uh, getting stuff off their chest and and having a fetch fest about how bad and frightening it all is and and they're and they're clearly angry because they feel like they don't probably feel like they don't have control and they're frightened um is i just say well why don't we just stop for a moment and realize we don't know what's going to happen but let's talk about what we can actually do like uh what can we do to protect our houses from fire? What can we do to about water sources? What do we do about planting trees versus not planting trees and where they should be? You know, what are some practical suggestions? Anyway, I think that about wraps it up for today's show on fear. This is Your Own Health and Fitness. I'm Lena Berman with Jeff Fawcett. Remember that you can visit our website, yourownhealthandfitness.org, for easier extended access to our over 600 archive shows with our library card feature, and you'll find a free stream of this week's show. It's all at yourownhealthandfitness.org. And our email address, if you want to get hold of us, is admin at yourownhealthandfitness.org. This is Philip Mulderie, host of The Sunday Show. Join me and my guests every Sunday morning, 9 to 11. We'll be talking about politics. We'll be talking about the state of things around us. Plus, we open the phones to your called-in questions and comments. That's every Sunday morning, The Sunday Show on community-powered KPFA. This is a statement from a local station board candidate. The views expressed are not those of KPFA management or staff. Hi there. My name is Yuri Gottesman, and I'm running for the local station board to help ensure that KPFA remains a place for radical, truth-telling radio. 
I've worked in the labor movement for more than eight years, about five years as a union organizer and three years as a union attorney. One of my skills is the ability to bring people together, and I believe I can do that for the board. So why should you vote for me, Yuri G? I'm down to earth, practical, and I work hard. People call me no nonsense. But not big on excuses, I like to get things done by working collaboratively with people. I'm proud to be supported by all the endorsers at SaveKPFA.org. Please vote for me, Yuri G, and the rest of the Save KPFA slate. Thanks for listening. For more information, go to elections.pacifica.org.